This is House Einstein podcast number 41. I am Osman with House Einstein, and with me is Hamish Crabb. Hello, hello. I'm Hamish Crabb, in case you missed it. And welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining us. If you are new to our lovely podcast, our show, then you are in... Um, you are in for a surprise, a delight, for a treat. This is a podcast that's focused on real estate issues, but to keep our attorneys happy, it needs to be categorized as entertainment. If you are a client or a prospective client, please visit us at houseeinstein.com and contact an agent directly so we can advise you about your real estate situation. But otherwise, please just consider this podcast pure entertainment that's right and we'll we'll do our best to try and provide a few good yucks osman your voice is a little gravelly today what's going on thanks for checking in on that <laughs> I, i'm suddenly a bass instead of a tenor and um i just have something going on congestion wise it's a cold or something along those lines it seems to be hanging out on top of my vocal cords so i've gone from yeah, being a tenor one to being somewhere in the bass category and uh, enjoy. We'll see how it works out. You know, I'll check the viewer retention and see. Yeah. Maybe I'll have to edit your voice in the future. Yeah, it could be the sultriness of the deep bassy Ooh, sound. The sultriness. Well, who Our are mis- we? <laughs> uh, we? Exactly. Our mission at House Einstein is not to delight your ears. Our mission at House Einstein is to help you make a smarter real estate decision. And I've been in the real estate game for 20 years. Prior to that, I was in the investment community. I guess you could say I'm still in the investment community. We've just switched asset classes and have chosen to focus on one particular asset class. And whether you're buying or selling, when you choose to work with our brokerage, we're really doing our best to help you think through your decision. Market your home well if you're selling. Do your due diligence thoroughly if you're buying. All those things that add up to being smart about this huge decision to buy or sell real estate. And with that, I think we should just jump to the topics du jour. Does this sound good, Hamish? I think that hits it really quickly, though. Osman is the employing broker and founder of House Einstein. He's quite well published. Uh, We've got a fantastic newsletter, which you should absolutely check out on our website. We'll be writing something up for this month. Uh, It'll include fresh listings, which we can't talk about on any public forum. So that's the best place to get our inside scoop on what's out there currently. I'm also Hamish, the producer for the podcast, and I help with uh, deal flow, marketing, pretty much anything the brokerage needs. I try to be the the Johnny on the spot. All right. Jack of all trades. Yeah. All right. With that said, um, let's just jump into what our topics are today. So we're going to talk a little bit about market conditions as well as some of the systemic changes when it comes to closings. We're gonna hype up a little bit, a listing that's coming next week. And then we're gonna talk about a couple of different properties that closed in the last week, two of which are our own listings, well, two of which are our own deals, one on the buy side, one on the sell side, and one that we didn't actually have involvement with, but that's still a very curious and interesting deal in Dakota Ridge. We're going to touch on some news stories today, including the occupancy law change that Colorado Governor Jared Polis just signed that uh, is going to change the landscape across the state when it comes to occupancy. Mm -hmm. And we're also going to talk a little bit about Rocky Flats, which is in the news and how it's being dug up for a bike lane. Yep. (laughs) Um, We're going to talk about a couple of things that you probably don't know unless you happen to be in the real estate profession. We're going to talk about sign crossing, and we're also going to talk about how deal pressure affects buyers and sellers. And then we'll wrap it all up with a pretty bow, and we usually keep this podcast to about an hour. Uh, We won't know exactly how long we go until we get there, but we usually try to keep it to an hour. So thanks again for joining us, and those are our topics. Absolutely. Well, jumping in first, I, I put this topic in, so I kind of feel some uh, responsibility to, to introduce it. Um, you know, I, I joined the team in 2022, post-pandemic, and didn't really know firsthand kind of how things were before, uh, before the pandemic. But one of the things that is noticeable in the deal is closing. Um, 
buying a home is a, a huge kind of life event, life milestone. And typically there's a little bit of fanfare to it. There's a little bit, I, I say like ribbon cutting, you know, with the big scissors or a big check or um, at this point, you know, like some cardboard cutouts of a home that you take a picture through. Um, but I had a conversation with one of our clients who closed on a deal we'll talk about later in the podcast. And uh, she was like, so this is it? Like, I just signed this on the on the website and I'm done. And I'm like, yeah, it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit lackluster at this point. And um, I just think it kind of needs a mention, you know, like uh, it's an awesome technological advancement to be able to close remotely or close from the comfort of your own home office and everything. But uh, it does kind of leave a little bit of that, like, I don't know, it's just anticlimactic, right? Um, so it's just top of mind. I, I appreciate that. And it has changed Hamish. When I first got into the business, we, we did closing dinners for every single client. And the reason we were doing closing dinners, it was, uh, it was a carryover from my time in the investment banking world and a closing a after the deal was done, after the tombstones were issued, having a nice celebrate celebratory dinner, usually up on the firm, was kind of a thing, right? And so I felt like that was a nice way to continue a tradition and notice and have it be a big deal. And in the first 15 years, 17 years of doing this, our closings were in person. Buyers and sellers mostly were at the same table. Sometimes they weren't. There was one agent in town who was known to keep them separate. Um, I attended hmm. closings with her. that She didn't even know who her clients were, which is a whole nother, nother story. Um, she wow. would introduce herself to my clients and say, I'm your agent. I was in the room when she did it. I'm like, you have no idea who your own people are. Like, that's, she's a pretty that's big insane. name. Wow. Won't go any further on that. Off chat, um, you'll but, let me know. But she always, she's the only agent that routinely kept her buyers and sellers separate. Otherwise, unless the deal went sour for some reason, we usually closed together. And sometimes the seller's family or the seller themselves would be there crying. You know, it's a very emotional mm. thing selling a home. It's not like any other investment that I've ever been part of. People really, really get emotional. There's so many memories tied up with what the concept of home is for people. And, um, and, and if it went well, there was sort of a passing of the torch, right? Mm -hmm. You hear a little bit about the memories. And if something goes wrong with the HVAC and you want to know who they use for service, you often the buyers and sellers would exchange contact information. And that worked out. It was a very friendly thing. And then we would schedule a closing dinner with our side of the transaction to mark the event and take them to a nice place. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a panic attack about seven years ago because we went to the Flagstaff house. Oh. And because it was multiple uh, clients involved, so this was, I had oh, originally sold a home. An event? Well, no, it was, I had sold a home to the adult children, and then I sold a home to the adult, to the elderly parents. And they had like a family member in town. And so we ended up at the Flagstaff house. And the Flagstaff house has two and $3,000 bottles of wine <laughs> on their menu. And they knew I was treating, and they're like, oh, look at the oh, wine no. list. And, and my client leads over, and she's like, oh, look at these bottles of wine. And I'm like, oh, please don't do this. <laughs> were they just joshing you? Or were <laughs> they, they were. They okay. were. They, they, didn't, uh, they didn't order the $2,000 bottle of wine. Um, it still, though, was an expensive dinner. Mm. Um, but it, it also reminded me not to take uh, people to closing dinners at restaurants that have $2,000 bottles of wine on the menu. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but with that said, you gotta wonder uh, if uh, the restaurants will have like a separate menu. You know, like if you're treating people to dinner, <laughs> they'll give you that menu for the, for the right. guests. Please don't give the clients that the that, the, uh, the premium wine list. <laughs> yeah. we'd like the we'd like the mediocre wine list. <laughs> yeah. um, but closings now are are mostly electronic, and um, the buyers have a lot of paperwork to sign if they have a loan, and it it's sort of anticlimactic. Um, but I've been thinking about that and, and ways we potentially could celebrate it more. Um, and so that's something that I think some agents are more excited to do. Um, and I'm just so analytical and, and driven to do the performance side, the service side of this, that sometimes I honestly miss the cue to, you know, bring the balloons. I, I also don't like to bring a basket of things they don't need. Some agents do yeah. that. It's like a basket of garbage that's <laughs> plastic and bad for you. It's like candy and all these things that are bad for you. Um, 
your, one of your predecessors, Hamish, was really good at gifting. Excellent. And that was one of her true gifts. Her skills was gifting. <laughs> the gift was and gifting. And I, I just gave her full authority, which is why that one particular year, every closing got a solo stove um, with our branding on it. And yeah. many clients still tell me how much they love those solo stoves. And meanwhile, all I could think about is, please, God, don't set fire to the neighborhood. <laughs> like, liability. Please don't, please, exactly. Please don't start a wildfire. Like, you aren't even allowed to open burn in, in the city of Boulder. And here I am giving you guys solo stoves. Um, all right. Well, let's move on from that that experience. Uh, so, but yeah, uh, gifting is something we're, we're thinking about pretty heavily lately. Yeah, but overall, this segment's supposed to be about market conditions, really. And, That's right. Um, right now, in Boulder County, about thirty-seven percent of residential property on the market is under contract, which is pretty healthy. It's closer to a normal market than it's been in years. Um, prices have still risen overall, but you can see from the peak, and we'll, we'll we'll talk about that with one of these listings. Prices have dropped from the peak, but they're still up year over year in many cases, and uh, it it all depends on location, property type. Um, price range, the functionality of that property within the market, and we'll talk about that too. So this is where you know generic conversation about market conditions is not very useful. Mm. We'll walk you through some of the thought process that a buyer or a seller might go through when they're thinking about writing an offer and thinking about negotiating that offer, because it doesn't matter that the median sale price has gone up 8% and 37% of houses and condos are under contract right now, that's irrelevant. Um, where it really matters is knowing the value of the home and the demand for the home and what your other options might have looked like if you were shopping at a different time period. Like, how do you, how do you take some of the risk off the table for buyers and sellers? That's, that, I think, is much more relevant. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little further on in the podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, listing hype. <laughs> um, we cannot give you the address yet because I don't have a firm launch date and the moment I give you the address we have 24 hours to get it on the MLS and the way we work is we really want to prepare the home properly we want um, the home looking its best we want the photography done right we want the videography done right and then we want to list it we do sometimes use coming soon it does build hype but we play by the rules at House Einstein we don't we don't break them uh, vehemently, which some agents will do with this whole process of, of pocket listings and so forth. But that this particular place, I will say this, if you're shopping for a two bedroom condo in Gold Run that has the preferred layout, is in a sprinklered building, is a larger unit, doesn't have that tight cramped kitchen that's a galley style kitchen that a lot of units have, has the garage space, has the elevator, uh, all of those things, if that's what you're looking for and one that has not been trashed by a series of tenants is still in very good condition, this is a, an opportunity and these units do not come up all the time. Um, garden level units, sometimes front on the creek, those are very nice, mm. but you also have a security risk with the garden level units. And I've had parents of CU students tell me that there's no way they're gonna let their, their CU student child have bedrooms with glass that is literally at the garden level where an intruder who's camping in the creek or whatever and, and methed out can come barging through the window, they don't feel good about that. And they're yeah. not immune to the news about, about property crime and street crime in Boulder. It's growing um, with our, our unhoused population and, um, and, the, and Gold Run is right on the creek. So it's still an amazing location. It's one of the locations I first lived in when I moved to Boulder. It has a lot of amenities. And if Phenomenal. I were buying, this was a unit I would buy. But right now, mortgage rates are not particularly favorable for investors. The investment community is on pause because rates are so high, including me. I'm like, well, this, if I can't get it to cash flow with 30% down, <coughs> excuse me, I'm probably not buying it because I can earn 5% with just money sitting in the bank. So why would I take 4.5% and then also have a mortgage that isn't even being covered by the rent? I'm paying every month to put money in. But if you have a CU student, or you're a young professional yourself, or you need you need a lock and leave uh, apartment to be close to your family. This is actually a really good choice. Mm -hmm. um, one of our advisors owns 15 units in Gold Run, <laughs> and he's he's just continued to build concentration because he understands. Just double down. Broad, 
Yeah, what a broad base of people that this complex appeals to, the property types. It's in a great location. It's not overpriced. <coughs> oh, man. Bless you. Hamish, I think you're going to have to do a lot of the talking today. Oh. This, um, It feels like I, I've got like so much scratchy in my throat. I can jump um, in a right. bit, too, if you want. <laughs> no, I think that's probably enough about this Shadow Creek unit, but you will see it on the market almost certainly early next week or maybe middle of next week. And Hamish, we need to plan our f photography and videography. Um, the only question is the staging, and I'm talking to the seller about that mm -hmm. right now. Okay, fantastic. Okay. All right, so let's jump into some sales of the week. That's right. Starting with 672 West Aspen Way. Why don't you tell, tell our audience about that deal? Well, this is going to be a tough one for me to put some color into. I didn't see this property in person, and I also wasn't part of the offer writing process or <laughs> really uh, much to do with it. So, um, okay, maybe, maybe from I, my there's perspective, some <laughs> there's some aspects of this that um, we cannot share with you. Right. But I will share with you that our clients and ourselves were very aggressive in pursuing this property. And um, the buyers preferred to have single story living and there were, we looked at a couple of different options in Lafayette as well as Louisville. We also looked at past sales for the last year. We almost wrote an offer on a competitor that was significantly more expensive and a much larger home. But th when we ran the comps on that, it was pretty clear. And I, and I'm, I can't really talk about that deal cause it hasn't closed yet. Um, mm. but there was, it was very clear they were getting multiple offers and uh, I have a pretty good relationship with the listing agent, and he very helpfully disclosed the high water mark because we were getting ready to submit. Wow. And we would have been nowhere near competitive. And he's like, don't bother. If your offer's at this number, mm. you're just going to waste your professional time writing offers that aren't going anywhere. And that's what professional agents do, by the way. This is why when you hear from your friend down the street or whatever at the racket club after pickleball that they got 17 offers, I want you to remember one thing. That is not a sign of competency. That is a sign of incompetency. Yeah, you because need to you manage can't offers. You, you can't negotiate with 17 people at once. And you wasted a lot of people's time because likely there's only two or three offers in that 17 offer scrum that are worth actually looking at. And so what you do with those two or three offers is you pit them against each other and you move the watermark even higher, but then you discourage all these other people from wasting time because it's a complete distraction. And a listing agent doesn't have time to review 17 offers that are each 18 pages long. I mean, it's, and, and verify the competency of the listing agent, check the lender letter, read the personal note, all the things that they do when they're evaluating offers. We, we put together a table, by the way, Hamish, you've seen this many mm -hmm. times. It's, you know, it's got five columns in it. We pull away usually, personal information, you know, make yeah, it clean oh, and cut. So to protect the seller from liability, we, we don't, yeah, we, we, we initialize everyone's names, but we do look up the agent mm -hmm. and check their experience. When were they licensed? Do we know them? Or do they have a reputation? There are so many factors that go into which offer gets selected other than price. But of course, price is the first thing that everyone looks at. And in a typical multiple offer scenario, you you just ignore all the offers that aren't even close, right? There's no point. You look at the two, three offers that are close. But anyway, just remember that when you hear 17 offers, it usually is a sign of incompetence, um, not a sign that you're getting great service. And I'm always reminded of the first offer that I put in on a house. And, you know, we tried our hardest to get contact with this listing agent who just wouldn't hit any, like wouldn't take any of our calls um, they held an open house. I went there on the open house and they weren't there. They had an assistant there. So I couldn't get any guidelines, no information. And wouldn't you know, they had 18 offers. And um, I actually think had I'd known, uh, I would have been able to offer and being competitive to the sale price of that home, which right. is, you know, that sucks. But I'm actually very stoked with the place that I got. So, yeah. Yeah. You got a great house. And uh, there's more to, more than price. There mm -hmm. are, whether you're paying cash or there's a loan involved, there's the quality of the lender and the reputation of the lender. There's the amount down, believe it or not, people look at that yep. too. <coughs> that that uh, adds a lot of confidence to whichever offer you're looking at selecting. 
and sometimes there's very human factors that you're not supposed to be selecting on. Um, so that's something that we try to protect our seller from. Like, for example, um, you can discriminate against investors because investors are not a protected class. So right. if they say, you know, we really want a family that lives next door. Well, familiar f family status is you can't discriminate against families, but you can you can say we don't want an investor buying it yeah, because that's not a protected not class. <laughs> but with that said, it does still re re increase the liability of a seller for the buyer filing a complaint. So if you do those types of things, you should do so consciously knowing the risks. Yeah. And uh, uh, one thing that I wanted to add right at the start was uh, you mentioned that we play by the rules. And uh, just to add a little bit of fun to that, uh, deep down on our YouTube channel, Hal Seinstein, Osmond's got a video, When the Real Estate Police Come Knocking. And uh, it's just a fun one. It's worth checking out. Because <laughs> we talk about it I've, so often. There are gray areas, and I played in a gray area for a really long time. And one day the realtor police came knocking and said, no, you cannot <laughs> talk about active listings. Um, you cannot write about active listings. You can't put a billboard out there about active listings. You have to put it under a newsletter, which is why, sadly, we have a newsletter. Well, I mean, I like having a newsletter, <laughs> yeah. but it's also... Now it's a private newsletter. I'd, right? I'd rather just put it all on the blog directly. Yeah. Instead, we have to embargo it till it closes. and It's annoying. So with that said, um, let's talk about our closing again, back to the steel. <laughs> yeah. So there are, um, this is a larger than, it, it's a 1,364 square foot ranch in a great location in Louisville. It is nicely tended by the owners. It had a few updates and our buyers were lucky enough to see it. And we got our offer in right away and went under contract and closed with cash. We did go over list, but only after closely evaluating comparable sales over the last 12 months. And it became very clear that some homes like this one can go to nine without a problem with a few wow. mild updates. This one's so, 827 for context. So we ended up at 827, which was over list. Uh, there was a secondary round of negotiation that, that brought a few thousand dollars off the price for inspection issues, but it all worked out. Our clients are super happy. They're going to be very close to their grandkid, and uh, they're in a, a great property that's all one level, and and we're happy for them. And mm -hmm. and there's, it was really lovely to work with them. They're smart people. They're, they're scientists. Um, they're data people. And they also value service, and it's like straight up the fairway for who we look for as clients. Um, people that understand the value of doing the data analysis. And we did it live, right? It's not something that I need two days to do. It takes 15 to 20 minutes. We do it live on a video call. And that's what guided our offer to go over list. You don't always have to go over list to get a house. In this particular case, it looks like it was intentionally underpriced. And we had to move very aggressively. And we looked at Pat, all the other sales that were similar in the last 12 months. And what did those deals look like? Did they go for over list? What, would, what did they sell under dollar per square? What were the gating factors or the deal notes? Like, was it in a busier location? Was the property updated or not? We went through each of those sales before we wrote this offer. So, and my clients made the call. We don't push them to go over list, but we need them to see what the actual market's doing for this particular type of property and location. And so they're very happy. Um, the seller's getting a post-closing occupancy, which I think they'll enjoy. They needed that. That helped us get the deal done. And so we scooped it. That was a super aggressive move fast type of deal. And mm. if you're going to scoop it, meaning you're offering during that coming soon period, right? We shouldn't have even seen the house. Um, and I didn't, by oh, the way. Yeah. It's a whole another story. That's right. Okay? This is that house. Okay. So this is one of those things that um, our clients were lucky enough. They were, they were, they were, they happened to be walking by and they happened to see the home, but not with the seller home. And they got enough info by being aggressive to feel confident about that house. And that's why we wrote the offer and that's, and that's why they went over list and we did our homework. They were well-educated about the market and they were smart, savvy and aggressive clients. Um, we did not break any real estate really rules sensible, yeah. to be hundred percent clear. Um, but we also encouraged our clients to be as aggressive as necessary to get what they wanted. And, and they did. And it wasn't as aggressive as the other home that they were thinking about in Lafayette that we declined to go on. So it was a win. Mm -hmm. All right, with that said, let's move on to deal two. Yeah. Um, 817 Racket two. Lane. So this is our listing, Hamish, and I think you could tell the story of this one. 
Well, I can. And I wanted to provide a little bit of color. Um, I wasn't there on this exact point. And for some reason, the phrase providing color is top of mind in this podcast. Um, Osmond, you helped these buy or these sellers buy the place originally. Um, and I remember when we were doing, I think it was our first or second walkthrough to prepare the home for sale. You had brought up that you know there's a lot of joy when you help your buyers find a good place and you know it's good because it's also going to sell well and it, it it's um it's it'll stand kind of the test of time so to speak and that's kind of what this house is uh we had a, a decent amount of competition oh i'm gonna air quote competition uh pop up and these homes backed to the busy street kind of entering into the neighborhood and just the other day when I went over to check out or pick up the listing uh, materials, I noticed that they were still on the market. At least one was. The other one, maybe the sign blew away in the wind because the frame was still there, but there was no actual listing sign. Um, and that kind of just <clears throat> jogged in my mind, right? Because you're, you want to buy a house that satisfies all your goals, but you still want to buy a house that you can move relatively easily if you have to. And um, that just stuck with me. But this home... Uh, owned by some fantastic, lovely, intelligent people. Uh, we worked with them quite closely uh, to bring the home to list, um, bounced around a few different ideas, right, staging and whatnot. They elected to stage themselves and did a fantastic job, so much so to the point that the buyers wanted some of the furniture, um, which not being staged, it was uh, something that we were able to work out. Um, putting the video together, the listing signs, all the material and everything that we did with this home, um, we, we took a great deal of care and planning to it. Uh, I think we were working on the script uh, well in advance for this one. and um, Script for the video. Yeah, yeah, video script. Um, and, and we also quickly identified, I think, uh, even before they had decided whether or not they were going to sell, um, we got a, a list of selling points from them and began kind of crafting the pitch that we wanted to, to put on this listing. Um, and ultimately, it worked out really well. There was the first weekend of showings, which we attended every single one. Um, and I was illuminated to the fact that some listing agents like to book showings and then not show up, um, which also led to me being able to read a good swath of the book that I was reading at the time. Um, and ultimately, we ended up going under contract with these buyers who I think they checked it out on that first weekend. Um, and then they <laughs> continued to view the home six more times. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Osmond, you want to take a... Yeah. I thought it was five times, but maybe it was six. I, I stopped six. counting after Well, a she also before... deleted a showing and then added one on, so that even if we go back to look, it's not 100% reflective. These buyers were very careful. Mm -hmm. um, so let, let me back up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Again, we, we represented the sellers, but this was their fourth deal with us. Wow. I helped them buy a house in uh, Noble Park, and I helped them sell that house a few years later in Noble Park and buy this house. And this house was bigger for their um, growing family and was a better fit for what their needs were at the time. But what Hamish mentioned is something I tell all of my clients uh, on the buy side. If the house doesn't make sense or if it's going to be a problem to sell, it has a visible and obvious and very difficult to correct defect or, or uh, impairment, like a, being on a busy road, I'm going to tell you that, that this may not be a great idea. Some clients, I will say it twice. And I don't usually say it three times. There's one client that's asked me to say it three or four times. They now are not shopping, thankfully. They, we found Oof. them a house after a long search. Um, but they really wanted me to emphasize how much of a bad idea this house is because they wanted me to be a sounding board. And, and I am happy to do that for clients. But if you buy a house that is, is your, when you're buying it in mind for the broader market. So when I worked on Nantucket, mm. we used to call this the Nantucket model. Right. And, and what that meant was when people buy homes on Nantucket, they have a mental model for what the house should look like. And that includes things like beadboard and sort of a sea blue paint scheme. And it, it should feel kind of cottagey. And if you build something that it doesn't fit that mental model, mm. even if it's for your own personal enjoyment, you may pay a penalty for that when you go to sell it. And the same thing is true for Colorado. In Aspen, there's a mental model for what an Aspen home looks like. If you're going to spend $10 million in Aspen, it better have rough rock on the outside and post and beam interior. It better feel like you're like you're in the Yellowstone Lodge yeah. or something, right? Like Straight that's out of the what series. you're going for. 
without the series, not the actual Yellowstone Lodge from the move, from the television series. It better look kind of rugged western, and that's what buyers are expecting with a t- with a touch of sophistication. What they don't want typically is an antler. You know, an the eccentric antler, um, chandelier. <laughs> yeah, they, the the old fashioned candle light bulbs. That stuff looks so horrible. Typically, they don't want to see that, but they still want to see kind of a western theme feel to Aspen Homes with a luxury touch. Here in Boulder, it, we're in a primary home market, but there are a lot of luxury homes as well. So this home is not a luxury home but it has a certain layout that appeals to the vast majority of buyers. Mm -hmm. And that means bedrooms are primarily on the upper, the two-story layout with the primary and secondary bedrooms on the upper. There's an office or maybe there's a a guest room on the main. That's the other thing that's very beneficial. This home did not have that, but this home did have basically an au pair residence in the basement. And a a large, uh, generous guest room with a... Uh, area that you could set up a living room and a food preparation area. And all of that becomes basically like its own standalone apartment. And a previous owner had actually designed it with access through the garage. So you didn't even have to go through the main house to get into the basement. You could go directly through the garage. So this type of home has a lot of appeal for a lot of people. And the previous owner, because I know we helped them buy this house, took really good care of the home itself too. It had interesting detail like the hardwood that had all that inlay oh, yeah. pattern into it. People don't do that, right? Unless they, it's like a labor of love to do things like that. Yeah. They pay a lot more to have that level of finish and care. And this home just exuded that. Even though the kitchen wasn't brand new, the bathrooms weren't brand new. Everything about the house really exuded well-maintained, cared by owners. And it, and the functionality of the home was really primo. It worked for such a wide swath of the market and it wasn't in a busy location. It's in the Meadow Glen neighborhood, hmm. which tends to be a little older, but it, it is, is a neighborhood that has its own little private walking paths that actually were in the news right before closing, <laughs> or right as we listed about yeah, right how list. the, the rules don't allow dogs on those inside paths. So that was quite, quite an interesting story. No one ever asked about it, which I was worried about. Um, you're allowed to walk dogs on throughout the neighborhood, but not on those interior paths. Of course not. And there's some, some HOA people that have a bug about it. Um, and what, yeah. Anyway, well, the neighbors is like I haven't ever heard anybody platform neighbors as much as the neighbors themselves, the sellers, and the buyers. Um, the neighbors helped sell the house. Yeah, absolutely. The neighbors met the buyers. The neighbors were very they were very sad to see our clients leave because they had little kids, and little kids like were part of the neighborhood. Like it was a big deal, and it was really sad to see that our clients leave. But the neighbors definitely were part of the sale process. They were engaged. Um, and and wanted to help this work and did things to help us get the deal done. And they also kept an eye on the house because our clients weren't even here. They moved. Mm -hmm. So um, other aspects of the deal that are interesting is that um, we we priced it a little on the high side. We knew we were going a little high, and we originally had talked about potentially dropping the price, and we held off because we knew this offer was coming. We were like, should we drop it to 1.32? Should we drop it below 1.3? Well, there's this offer that might be coming. Let's hold off. So these are the types of conversations you should be having with your listing agent where relevant showing feedback can impact when price reductions are made. Because typically when you make a price reduction in in the seller's head is we just dropped the price 75 grand. But in the buyer's head, they're like, oh, they just dropped the price 75 grand. Let's go for the jugular and try it for another 75. So that's, you know, that's sort of the thought process that happens between buyers and sellers. But in this case, we held off dropping the price, and eventually the buyer wrote a very reasonable offer that was right in the middle of where we thought the home would sell and what we had originally advised our client where it might sell. So it all worked out. Um, We held the price at the original list price. It sold for 1.3, and um, I think the buyer is very happy with the home. It had a lot of nice things, including that uh, the Tesla the Tesla panels and the heat pump, Mm. all the energy efficiency upgrades. These sellers were also scientists, These, in this case, yeah. climate scientists. Scientists are my people. We speak the data language. We, we talk about analysis. And they, they like the lack of fluff. Um, and, and they like the lack of BS when we talk about reality when it comes to selling homes or buying homes. So that's the story of this deal. I think the buyer got a great house. Um, and I think the, the buy side agents that were involved did a great job. And uh, at the end of the day, we did a bunch of extra things, Hamish, that normally agents don't do. But Extra when mile. your clients have 
move to Europe and there's <laughs> nobody to move a few appliances that make any sense, you and I are showing up with moving straps and a trailer to get these things out of there and happy to do it. It's just, it's just what we, sometimes you just yeah. got to do what you have to do. So, um, there you have it. What was I? Oh, maybe this is a, a topic better tabled for another day or later in the podcast, but uh, on the flip side of that too, what does it signal, um, as, as a buyer, you know, how many times, how many showings on the same property is too much? You know, at what point does that begin to signal something else to the seller? You can table it too. We can, I can write it down and we can go. No, I mean, no, it's a great, it's a great question, Hamish. It's rare that you see that many showings. Mm -hmm. Um, More commonly, a buyer will do a first showing and then schedule a second showing and then write the offer. Mm -hmm. That's normal. Sometimes there's a third showing, but that's rare. Um, and, and it's sometimes a sign that they just haven't seen enough homes. They, aren't, they haven't been well-educated about market conditions. And so they're not sure what to offer. They need guidance. And in the absence of, like we do, we call it going into the war room, right? If mm-hmm. my clients say they want to write an offer, we're not recording a podcast. <laughs> no. We're not, like I'm, if I'm on a mountain biking trip in Fruta, I've got Starlink You're on and we're over. having a meeting <laughs> in the van, which I did on, yeah. the, on the offer we just wrote um, and just put under contract today. There was a, there was a Starlink meeting from the van. Um, yeah, we moved the, on that one. The war, the war room takes priority. And, and in the war room, you should go through the comps. You should also do, and well, actually, we'll talk about this in a second. We're going to hold off on what yeah. else you might do. That's further down Teaser. our topic list. Okay. All right. Number three. Let's move on. Dakota Ridge Boulevard. This is our third sale of the week that we are discussing. This particular listing, we were not involved with the purchase or sale of, but we did do a very... A detailed video on what you should know about this neighborhood. So check that out on our YouTube. We'll put a link in the show notes. Dakota Ridge has a lot of pluses and a few minuses. Um, and those minuses we talk about, or I talk about in the video, as well as what's right. And that's what we like to do is tell you what's right and what's wrong. So you get the full picture. But this particular listing mm-hmm. was built in 1996. So it's not that old of a home. And it's a classic two-story. Dakota Ridge Boulevard is a street that gets some traffic. It is the through street through the neighborhood. You turn off the Lee Hill, and you're on Dakota Ridge Boulevard. This home was east-facing, which is not particularly great, but it's okay. You might get some pocket views, but it's a pretty decent-sized house. 3,600 square feet, five bedrooms, four baths. Two bedrooms are in the upper, one bedroom's on the main tour in the basement so yeah that's big strike one for the home is that the layout is split and by split i mean that the majority of bedrooms are not on one level and you might get away with one on the main and three on the upper but putting two in the basement likely could mean that teenagers are in the basement which people like putting teenagers in basements and teenagers like it too check for radon younger Younger kids don't like, like, parents don't like putting younger kids in the basement. Yes, thank you. Please yeah. check your rate on levels. Um, but for whatever reasons, and I think we'll know what the reason is pretty quickly, this home sat. So it was first listed in September at 1.95. And after about 30 days, they dropped it to 1.875. And then in middle of December, right before the Christmas, they pulled it off the market And then um, it was in withdrawn status until the end of February when that first listing expired. Mm. Now, this agent simultaneously relisted the home on January 16th. So between uh, between January 16th and February 29th, it was both in withdrawn and active status. And this sort of thing, I mean, it's not that hard to figure out what's going on, but it's just a sign of lack of attention. Like, how do you have an active listing and a withdrawn listing at the same time? But same agent came back on January 16th, officially at 1.8. So now you've dropped it and well, actually a little bit more at less than that. 1.9, 1.795 or 796. So you're looking at a reduction of another 70. You're looking at yeah. $80,000 reduction in price. Nothing happened. Three weeks later, they decided to drop it again, 40000 and then another couple of weeks pass, and now they've dropped it to 1.65. So this game that some agents play, this price is right game, they just keep dropping the price, sends a very strong signal to the market that something's wrong with the house. Seller doesn't know what to price it. They're not confident about the pricing at all. 
Um, and so they, they threw out a dart with a very high number, and now they're doing death by a thousand paper cuts till they <laughs> land on a price that the market clearing price. In my opinion, this is not how you should sell a house. Um, I think that you, you should price it right and be confident in your pricing. But sometimes the market changes under you, mm. right? And that's happened to us too, where we priced it high and found out later that you know the market's not there for this house. But for um, for Dakota Ridge, there should be plenty of comps that help support pricing. It's only when you're in the mountains or you've got something really rare and unique um, that you, and there aren't good comps that this this price it high approach starts is to show more intelligent. Yeah. It also makes sense if you're if you're dealing with a true luxury home and in Boulder under two million is not luxury anymore. You probably need to be north of three to really be in the luxury category. <coughs> On that, and there it makes sense. Well, I mean in general. Yeah, so no. In the city of Boulder, on you that, need to be north of. Th- Just a quick. Oh, um, I was showing. I'm sorry. M- yeah. yeah, I was showing my friend uh, one of our podcasts, and you were saying that, and his jaw just dropped. He's like, "No way!" And I'm like, "Yeah, man. <laughs> like, you should see some of the homes here." <laughs> it um, was just. Yeah, like, I mean, we now yeah. nine and ten million dollar homes, and there's a new one that was just listed at nine point five. That is absolutely gorgeous. That's in Table Mesa. That's worth looking at. There's another one that's listed. That's I don't know. We were just critiquing the photos on with the fake sunset and the and the stained driveway. We won't mention the address yeah. of that one, but things that could be corrected in seconds weren't corrected on a nine million dollar listing. It's like, or maybe that's six. The nine and right a half is, yeah. is is a new one that's just absolutely jaw droppingly pretty. Um, but it, we could we'll, maybe we'll write about those in fresh listings so oh, yeah. I can critique them more thoroughly. <laughs> yeah, those two. Um, that's how you make friends. <laughs> but long story short, this this was Chase the Market, and they were on for a pretty long time, right? And they were on from September through um, through just a couple of days ago, through April 11th, when it finally sold for 1.57. So that last negotiated discount, 1.57 over 1.66 minus 1, so another 5.4% below list. You know, and that's pretty typical for a home that is a stale listing. You expect it to sell for 5% below list or even a little more. Um, yeah. And I always tell my clients that, look, you may have gotten a great deal, but did you get the right house? Because that's so much more important than getting a good deal. Because getting a good deal on the wrong house is a disaster. You still got the wrong house. And someday you may have a hard time selling it. Um, but overall, the home didn't present badly. It needed a few updates. But, it, you know, the fixtures have been updated. The kitchen looked pretty good. There was nothing really functionally wrong with the house other than the split layout and Dakota Ridge Boulevard is a little busy. It's east facing. Mm-hmm. Of course, pros and cons about the neighborhood. Check out our video for that. But this is a lesson in price it right and, and you'll be much happier. Um, and also think twice before, you know, the test the market strategy in September is not a good idea. Yeah. Um, if you want to test the market, test it in the spring. Like you could test the market. A l- you have a couple more weeks now. You could potentially test the market. But the but the game's over by the end of June. You've got to be so you, sorted any later than that. People don't have a lot. Yeah. So if you're going to list in July, August, or beyond, you should be much more aggressive with your pricing strategy as a seller. And if you're going to list in September, you better really be aggressive because there's not a lot of people looking in September. So that's the story of hundreds of thousands of dollars in price reductions on this particular listing. Um, I got a question. Not for a bad you. house, though. Yep. Go for it. Looking at it, would you call this a McMansion? It looks like a McMansion, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so there were a lot of, uh, of, of builder-constructed homes, like larger builders that were involved in Dakota Ridge. Um, I guess larger for Boulder, right? We're not talking about giant mm-hmm. builders like Toll Brothers that build hundreds of homes at a time or thousands of homes a year. Um, I can't remember if Markel was the builder on this one. I wasn't here in 96 <laughs> when it was constructed. Me either. But, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, it was Spectrum Building Enterprises in 1995 that uh, sold it to Triple Five Apartment and Construction Company, so unknown builder names. And then um, Robert Van Eschen bought it for 262 five. He was the first owner in 1996, mm. right before uh, New Year's at the end of 1996. So that's the story. Um, and it looks like this might have been whoever bought the house is now the third owner of the home. Uh, it's sort of so McMansion Hamish is sort of a uh, I don't want to call it a slur. It right? is I though, know right? I, mean, I know what you mean. But that's sort of a real estate slur. Yeah, is to call something a McMansion. But 
You know, there are many homes like this one, and this one is mine, <laughs> right? Because it and it doesn't outright mean bad. I think it's just at this point, like a, it's got negative connotations to it. We've got to coin a new word. Bless you. Um, but yeah, I don't. I've got nothing personally against McMansions at this point. To me, it's just like more of like a style, right? Well, look, most of the homes in Boulder were built in time periods when they built a lot of the same style of house. Martin Acres, Table Mesa, um, parts of North Boulder, Dakota Ridge and Holiday. Mm. There are like you will see the the same like models ethos. repeatedly. Yeah. Like what? Like the same like architectural like ethos, like the same um, theme. You know. Oh, it's not just the same theme. Yeah. It's the same house, Hamish. Yeah. It's exactly the same house. It, and so Martin Acres had like four or five models mm -hmm. and they're all so similar. Once you've lived in that neighborhood, like I did for a long time, you know, those models, right? Like, you know, the yeah, Martinique, even though the, the, the owner may not know it's called the Martinique, but that's the Martinique because that's the big one. Yeah. And that's the one that has the stairs on the side and the, and the slight, it's slightly bigger than all the rest. So all those things you, you figure out. And so I don't personally like the term McMansion, especially when it's a family that's just looking for a place to, you know, have bedrooms that are that have decent sized closets for their kids mm -hmm. and a study room. And, you know, their home is their castle because that's where they're going to spend a lot of time with their family. And, and they came about and for so a I, reason. I kinda, there is a need for them, right? I mean, I think people are just jealous and annoyed at the lack of architectural creativity. But the reality is that um, people don't want to pay for custom homes unless they can afford it. So, you know, you're, you're basically dinging someone for just for buying for a home. being happy. <laughs> Well, for well, also buying a home that um, that there were there was focus groups, there were architects that considered all the trade offs and built one that appeals to a large number of people. I don't particularly find that uh, that that uh, McMansion term to be so helpful. Mm -hmm. Not everyone can afford, you know, that historic home in Mapleton Hill or that or custom home in North Boulder or in Table Mesa that's been you know scraped the lot and start over and build an amazing custom home. I mean, yeah, if everyone could do that, they would, but it just doesn't work that way in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd get into a McMansion if I could. Uh, I mean, I, if I had, you know, a bunch of rugrats and needed all the bedrooms I, and, and it fit the budget and fit the timeline and you had pressure of getting the kids in school, I certainly would too. Hey, you're going to... And I've helped many buyers and many sellers with McMansions. You're going to love this segue. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Go for it. Um, well... If I was to get a McMansion, I wouldn't need the Rugrats because I'd have enough bedrooms for plenty of unrelated individuals. <clears throat> That's an excellent segue, Hamish, because that brings <laughs> us to the news. And we should speed up a little bit. If you're still with us, thank you so much for staying with us. Let's talk about the big news article of the day or of the week. Governor Polis has signed House Bill 241007, also known as the HOME Act, which stands for Harmonizing Occupancy Measures Equitably. And he signed it on tax day, and this law prohibits local government from limiting the number of unrelated people living together under the same roof, and it aims to end what has been perceived as discriminatory occupancy limits. It takes effect July 1st. And supporters say the bill are, uh, improved housing options for students and older, Amer uh, older Coloradans, and gets rid of this old land use policy, but the critics say, well, it may not help who it was intended to help mm. without saying anything further. Um, so um, there's a lot of movement to reform land use in Colorado and to reform zoning laws and all sorts of things. This particular one, uh, one more piece of history, last year, the city of Boulder went ahead and bumped up its occupancy to five unrelated people anyway uh, from three, which was most of Boulder, was under the three occupant, un, unrelated occupants. Um, There's some pocket neighborhoods that had four. There were some grandfathered properties on the hill that had a lot more than four, like the, the Greek houses. So a year ago, this was already not really relevant, um, but now it's gone statewide. Mm -hmm. And the question is, now what? Yeah. So what do you think is going to happen, Hamish? Well, okay, to me, I'm generally a, a little bit of a supporter for this one. Um, there were a few houses when I was looking that I really wanted to make work, and they had the bedroom count and everything to make work, 
though I'm a single dude, right? Like, how do I get that many roommates in when there are these uh, unrelated occupant limits? Um, it's, I think this would be, and, and this is more of an appropriate first step than immediately changing the zoning laws. Um, there could be enough inventory or, you know, homes out there that this might actually alleviate a decent amount because people are beginning to house hack more and more, um, you know, those that are super rate sensitive and, um, just barely getting into a home. This helps kind of remove the pressure to, um, be able to take on that expense all, all by yourself. You're able to get a few more roommates. You know, if you have, I've got my basement, for example, um, there's a huge room down there that could easily fit a couple. And then I've got another guy and I've got this room, you know, now I can fill the house up quite a bit more. Um, there's of course, you know, worse things that you've got like traffic. Um, <laughs> my mind just went blank. Traffic is not the only thing that I was going to bring up. <laughs> traffic, parking, um, definitely increased wear on, on, uh, just local infrastructure and everything. But I, I'm more open to this one than I would be seeing like a, a sweeping zoning change because this at least lets the initial structures be completely filled um, before kind of a, a redevelopment of everything at the same time. My perception. And a great, <clears throat> a great perception yeah. uh, to have your, your point of view. Thank you for sharing it. You're wrong. I also, no. <laughs> you're not wrong. I know, just... I, look, I, when I first moved to Boulder, I lived on eighth street in a home that I still drive by slowly and stare longingly at. I drove by because uh, I love that Eighth Street the other house. day and thought of you. <laughs> Whenever I drive by that house, I, I you know I just feel nostalgia and wish I had bought the house years ago, um, and and maybe someday I will. I still think it's a fantastic house. But I lived with three other um, people in their early. Th I was in my late twenties. They were in their early thirties. Um, and so we overoccupied. <clears throat> there were four of us in the upper level of the house. The basement of the house had an unpermitted apartment, which had another person in it. So there were five people living in this house. And there were only three people on the lease. I've, I've and seen this exact situation. <laughs> I'm yeah. just laughing. So the way it worked is that um, we could have gotten busted at any point, and we were deathly scared of being busted. So we were really quiet and really nice to the neighbors, and we hoped and hoped and hoped they didn't turn us in. And they didn't. And it was never, we were never caught. This is a long time ago. And uh, that's, there, there are probably hundreds of those in Boulder, if not thousands of those situations in the city of Boulder of these people that are conscientious adults that have chosen to live together, but to afford living in Boulder. And they don't want to, they're not throwing parties, they're not annoying the neighbors, and they live under this threat of losing their housing and have for many years. And then there's the flip side, right? You've been living in the home, your home for many years, and you've got kids, or maybe you, you don't have kids, but you don't sleep well at night, and the neighbors next door have packed the house with 20-year-olds that are all at CU, and they're, they're smoking pot, <laughs> and they're playing beer pong and they're they're rocking out in the garage with their band and they're having huge house parties just a little and obnoxious a right? yeah and at four in the morning one of the drunk neighbor kids decides to set off firecrackers at the party right mm -hmm. like that is a nightmare scenario that's why we have the red cup rule in our due diligence list because you can't the red cup rule is to go check the neighbor's <laughs> recycle bin in the alley to see if it's full of booze bottles and red cups. Because if it is, you might have a party house next door and you really need to know that before you write an offer because the number of people living there doesn't actually dictate whether your neighbor throws parties or not or if they're over-occupying it or not or the ability to enforce the over-occupancy mm -hmm. or the justice in actually having an over-occupancy law to begin with. Because regulating humans and their familiar relationships is discriminatory. Right. So this is, this is tricky. And I we... I mean, we, I've got we know people, we're, friend, we're, like, go ahead. we're friends with people that are in um, creative, long-term relationships that involve multiple adults. Good point. And it could be a co-op or it could be something totally different. The New York Times had a very funny article. Of, well, I don't know if it's funny, <laughs> but very um, eye-opening article about a polycule. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah you should look it <laughs> okay. up, Amish. We're not. This is not that podcast. <laughs> is, we're not Leah those guys. <laughs> Leah and I had quite the, my wife and I had quite the conversation, Leah, about the polycule concept, because 
I mean, honestly, I don't know how you keep, uh, you know, two women happy. One woman happy in, in a healthy relationship is like, but two or more, like, how is that going to work? But people have those relationships, and some of them are very successful, including some of our clients in the past. Uh, one of our clients has written a book about polyamory and how to make it work. And she has for many, many years. <laughs> um, and she's an adult who's super responsible. And we've represented her on two transactions. And we, repre- and we represented her ex on one transaction. <laughs> two transactions. Both of them. Four transactions. Dang. Okay? So, um, so in, in, in the short, long and short of this is that I, I think that adults should be able to live together. And occupancy should not be based on familiar relationships. It might need to be based on bedroom count. Yeah. That seems to make some sense. Two per bedroom, right? right? Like, you can't have shanties. Right, at a, at a maximum. Yeah. But even two per bedroom, you're going to start seeing some of these three-bedroom houses with six people living in them. That is a real possibility, and I don't think that it could be regulated. I think housing of that type, you own the property. It's a right. Even if you're renting the property, I don't think you have the right to tell people they can't be roommates. Um, I, I think you can regulate the number of vehicles on the street. Mm-hmm. We could have permit parking, two per house across the entire city. You can regulate the, the noise ordinances. You can regulate all sorts of things. But regulating humans, I think, is unethical. I have a, one more point or consideration. Um, this many people to one home thing is a fantastic way for individuals to reduce their monthly cost of living, their housing payments. In the same breath, um, or I don't even know the same breath, the contracting prices and contractors and handymen in Boulder have been extremely expensive. And that industry will get priced out of being local to the area unless they raise prices like in relation to that. So having places like this where you can have cheaper cost of living allows for also, you know, uh, you can support more industries within the city. And the city can be more affordable overall, which is, to me, it's good. I, I like things when those prices are a little bit lower, personally. I'm a sure. bit of a bargain hunter. Okay. Yeah. But do, would you want to live next to, um, like, six trade workers in their 20s? <laughs> would tr- six that, trade workers want to live next to each other even, right? <laughs> right. Well, that, you know, and, and these guys are, and it's typically men, you know, they're they're working their normal day hours and then they're enjoying but, you know, beer at night. And, and this is sort of stereotypical. Yeah, totally. But, like, you could have a flop house next door. Mm-hmm. And that's what they used to be called, where people worked 12, 14, 18 hour days and would just go to this place and lay down and go to sleep. Um, when I lived on Nantucket, back to Nantucket, um, flop house. That's there were. I got a. That's a good one. Yeah, you can look that one yeah. up. And I, hopefully, it's not something I shouldn't say because <laughs> I sometimes worry my, my vocabulary is uh, dictating or is, is driven by my age. But when I lived on Nantucket, the island would import labor for the summer on a special visa program, and a lot of those kids came from Ireland and other places in the UK, and they were all in their twenties. And they would, because housing was so expensive and hard to find, they were, like eight of them would get together and rent a bedroom. Mm-hmm. And then whoever didn't, whoever was last, the last two or three people would have to sleep on the floor, would sleep outside. Like, but they all, like, they would like have four kids in a bed Jeez. to to make it to work. live together on that, to make it work. Yeah. And those kids were amazing, by the way. They worked hard and uh, I'll never forget. So I, I used to work at a youth hostel. They would show up early and figure out their housing and figure out their jobs so they would stay with us for like a week or two. And they would throw parties. This is the Star of the Sea hostel, by the way, if you're now oh, talking about listening to this. Shout out to my old <laughs> haunt, Star of the Sea, which is once again owned by the public, by the way. It was, it was bought briefly by a hotel developer. And the hotel developer has sold it back to... Um, the housing authority, thank God, or to the city or, or the town of Nantucket, and thank God it's not going to turn into a hoity-toity resort for just really wealthy people. Yeah. So I have a nostalgia for this this life-saving museum that was a hostel um, that I worked at for a few, for a while. Anyway, the kids they would have they would party at night, but the lights were out by like ten o'clock, and they left no mess. Mm-hmm. They enjoyed a rowdy conversation. They had a really fun evening. All the recycling was done. There was no mess. It was such a contrast to college age kids for me. College is different. That, yeah. That these kids from Ireland were very respectful. They, they'd they grown up, I guess, with alcohol not being a big deal. Like you have a couple of drinks and you go to bed. Who would have? You don't need to get wasted. Moderation, a crazy things. concept. 
the problem is CU students, when they get drunk, are likely to cause a ruckus. They're likely to break things. And that's the thing that yeah. I feel for, for people that end up with, you know, 12 college kids living next door in a three-bedroom house. Like, how is that going to work? Or a four-bedroom house, how is that going to work? And the, the laws are going to have to change to address the issues with over-occupancy, but not the humans in the over-occupied house. Mm-hmm. All right. Yep. That's enough about this topic, I think. Speeding right along. Uh, number two. Well, hold on. Okay. Let's talk about the market impact. And this is for oh, our client, point. Sam, who messaged me specifically saying, what's the market impact? Oh, Sam? Um, the market impact. Yep. Our buddy, Sam. So the market impact of this is that if it's a five-bedroom basic house, the demand for that has just gone way up. So these basic three-bedroom, two-bath, uh, sorry, five-bedroom, two or three baths, the Martin Acre style ranch with a full basement that has five bedrooms. Those homes are back to being cash cows if you bought it a while ago. And students do like to live together. Young people like to live together. And so there, there's a lot of demand and, and landlords in Boulder price it by the bedroom. So the people that lose out are adults, young professionals, mm-hmm. families that are looking for an affordable rental where that's not trashed out because there's a ton of really beat up rentals in, in Boulder. And so if you're in the market for a rental, you're going to be and you're and you're not a college age student that wants or 20 something that wants to live with a lot of other 20 somethings your your selection is going to be reduced you're going to see a lot more demand for that type of house by by a bunch of kids that are like sure mom and dad can pay 1200 a bedroom no problem yeah yeah it'll uh, it's going to shift kind of the the spread of, uh, spread yeah okay yeah there will be a, there will be a market impact and CU historically has added more students than housing and so housing is housing supply is not kept up so i would not expect student housing to get any cheaper in the city of boulder and i would expect mid-market housing to get even more scarce it has i think zero impact on luxury housing Mm. yeah nice i see i'm thinking right in my terms and i was thinking if i were to be that person but good point and good job taking it back to the market and and hitting those side cases. Well, you got to think about other use cases other than your own sometimes. Yeah. And it's helpful to get your perspective, Hamish, because I'm not thinking like a 20-year-old with three roommates or two yeah. roommates. So we balance um, here at House Einstein. And now we're going yeah. to balance over to the <laughs> second subject. Okay. Right. Not as good of a segue. Um, but a while ago, we touched on a podcast about Rocky Flats. Um, it's a wild... Hamish, I'm... I'm going to let you do this intro. Go for it. Because you've done the most homework on it. Yep. You're also the one with the Geiger counter. Yep. I'm going to grab, I'm going to grab another drink while you're, you're doing the intro. Oh, I like it. And then uh, but keep going. Okay. I'll talk to this blank wall. Um, <laughs> a while ago, we did a podcast on uh, the Rocky Mountain Flats, uh, wildlife refuge, kind of open space. Um, there's some developments nearby that we briefly touched on and everything, but Let me open up the news article here, and it will be in the description. The title is, Why are crews digging at the site of a former nuclear weapons plant? And it's kind of, uh, news these days has to be contentious or sensationalist just to get clicks. So that aside, why are they? Um, Back in the 50s, this used to be Rocky Mountain Arsenal. No. Whoa, I am not doing it too hot today. Back in the 50s, this used to be a uh, nuclear weapons manufacturing plant, mostly plutonium triggers. Um, And the triggers, exactly. And they frequently had plutonium fires. Uh, Plutonium, when it's atomized, is pyrophoric. And so it would go through the ducting systems and just spontaneously combust. Really cool stuff. Uh, Anyway, th- these fires and the plumes and the fallout is well documented, and you can see these maps online if you look them up and everything. But it was, and I'm not seeing the direct terms, but I believe it was akin to or close to a super fund where they essentially raised and removed like five or six inches of the topsoil um, to, to remove the contamination. And since then it sat, it was opened up for recreational activities in 2018, um, after being cleaned up in 2005. So just quick timeline recap in 89, uh, the facility went towards cleanup. It was completed in 2005 and then a refuge opened for, uh, recreational activities in 2018. Now back to the news article. Um, there is now construction there and the construction is from, 
the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Department, and it's part of a greater initiative uh, called the Rocky Mountain Greenway, which I'm a little sad that the only time that I'm finding out about this initiative is in an article uh, kind of against the Rocky Flats work that's being done. But this greenway is uh, a plan to connect the Rocky Mountain Arsenal National Wildlife Refuge all the way to the Rocky Mountain National Park up in Estes Park, which is a massive undertaking, but also a really neat and fun idea initiative. There's a ton of wildlife at the uh, Rocky Mountain Arsenal Wildlife Refuge. If you haven't been there, it's a gorgeous area and huge, huge reserved spot. So the fact that they're kind of connecting this area through uh, to other open spaces and everything, really cool concept, really cool idea. Um, I wanted to touch on it because I've for the, since I've gotten that Geiger counter that Osman brought up, um, I've wanted to get out to national or to Rocky Flats and go and measure. Um, plutonium, to my understanding, is an alpha emitter, so the Geiger counter won't really pick up anything anyway. But I just I wanted to go and check and see if I could find you know maybe I've got a rock that beeps a little higher or something. It's fun that way. Um, there has been there have been vocal uh, people speaking out against the developments that are ha uh, happening quite close to the Rocky Flats National. Wildlife Refuge, um, even at one of the developments, we have Blucifer, the blue horse that's right at DIA. There's another horse that's outside of the development at Rocky Flats that's wearing a full hazmat suit and a gas mask. So it's not like they're hiding the history or anything of it. Um, it's been declared safe. That's, of course, controversial. I think anything at this point is controversial. Um, I just thought it was neat to highlight it. There's a history here in Colorado, and if you're moving out, or moving in fresh, and you don't know these things, you know, we kind of, I at least geek out on stuff that's radioactive, so I, I can flag that for you. And uh, Osmond's got a, a plethora of history on Colorado too. Well, and uh, kudos on using the word pyrofluoric. Yeah, that's uh, that's a very uh, it's vocabulary word there for today. Did you search Hamish, it? I gotta uh, verify I used it right. <laughs> no, I'm just assuming it means it spontaneously combusts in air. Um, that's my guess yep. is what it means. You can you can clarify. But uh, we have advised the clients well before you joined us, mm -hmm. Hamish, to avoid Rocky Flats, uh, to avoid Candelas in particular, which is right next to Rocky that's Flats. Right. And we also send them um, the plume map of where radiation spread during the fires which is surprisingly large. It's south into the west. Mm -hmm. Sorry, south into the east. It's a large area that got oh. a high dose of radioactive fallout. So um, we encourage them to watch. Go to YouTube. You can do this now and, and search Rocky Flats. There's a handful of very interesting documentary style videos, some of which are a little alarmist. Um, but at least you know mm -hmm. what you're dealing with. And you also should know that typically concerns with the environment move in one direction, not less concerned, but more concerned. Most most issues that are environment related with housing get more concerning over time. Um, occasionally, there's things that we forget about because we figure out really aren't a big deal. So um, there's a market impact, whether it's legit or not. So asbestos is right, classic, nice. right? Mesothelioma affects people that have been exposed to asbestos fibers, but apparently only one type of asbestos fiber. And some people have told me that are scientists that if you dig into the data about mesothelioma, it's primarily those that smoke <laughs> that had mesothelioma with the asbestos, not all people exposed to mesothelioma. And the reason they explain is that your lungs naturally clear crap that you've sucked it mm -hmm. in right that you've that you've inhaled i shouldn't use the word crap but fibers it's and other fitting. things you've you've sucked in and i guess it's apropos Inhale. today i'm coughing <laughs> but if you smoke your cilia are paralyzed and degraded and you those particles stay stuck in your lungs and that's where uh, those fibers are were, were causing mesothelioma but today we blanket don't allow well we test for asbestos we encourage people to test for asbestos um, we also have them do their own research, but what we understand is as long as it's not disturbed, it's benign. Um, but with that I said... Mean, same thing for radon. Radiation. Uh, radon, Ra if you radon's smoke, it doubles like your chances. I didn't mean to completely interrupt you, but... You know, and now I'm wondering if I've confused with radon and, and oh. <laughs> asbestos. I think actually... 
You're right, and I was. It's right uh, on. Not asbestos that sticks in your lungs. That's the study. So thank you for clarifying that. Um, but the point is the same: that there's nuance that may always. or may not give you more or less concern, especially if you're a science-oriented person. And then there's market perception, and market perception doesn't it doesn't care what oh, the no. science says because people don't want to hear it, right? And EMF falls under this category. Like if they can see high tension power lines, they start thinking about EMF. Some clients in particular. So you just need to take that into account when it comes for resale, even if you're comfortable with the, the health risk that you may or may not be exposed to. And Rocky Flats is one of those things that um, we think buyers really should know about. And digging it up means that there'll be more exposure to dust that could be radioactive. And you can explain alpha, beta, and gamma radiation, Hamish, on another yeah, podcast. Maybe not even this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. No, I wasn't talking about this. No, podcast. I'll have like, to make a whole new one. Yeah, you need to start your own radiation nerd podcast. Oh. Who runs around with a Geiger counter? I love it that you have it, by the way. Yeah. But I, it's I such a it's, toy. It's fun. Yeah, it's such a, a good um, but it's good. Okay, okay. So let's hit the last segment so we can wrap up Shall because we? we are over an hour already. And I apologize that this went a little long. If you stuck with us this far, we are now going to reward you <laughs> with. A segment we like to call Tell Me Something I Don't Know. And that's named affectionately after Gordon Gecko, uh, who is being fed insider information by Charlie Sheen. And Charlie Sheen first is trying to give him news that he already knows about. Like, I'm just such a smart analyst. Here's, here's some analysis. And Gordon Gecko dismisses him and says, Tell me something I don't know, i.e., insider information, which, of course, in uh, the securities world is illegal, <laughs> but it's not illegal in the real estate world and to have insider information. For an exchange, also, it's not illegal to uh, insider trade. Okay, well, let's not yeah. get too far. <laughs> it is illegal to insider trade. It's not illegal to have information and be very well advised on what's going on in the marketplace. And one of the things that sellers need to understand, buyers too, but but actually, oh yeah, buyers and sellers, is that once you sign that exclusive agreement here in Colorado to work with a buyer's agent or a listing agent, it is very, very difficult to break that agreement. And it is really the agent that you hired that has the cards to break the agreement. Um, and if you go and purchase a property without or sell your property without that agent's involvement, you very likely are going to be liable for a commission. And if the agent's been doing their job, they've been marketing the home, They've been getting showings. They even brought you an offer. You may not have liked the offer, but they brought you an offer. I don't think you're going to have much cause to fire this person. And you should seek legal counsel first and foremost. So here's the deal. The Colorado Real Estate Commission has a position statement that says, look, if I get a phone call from somebody that already is in an exclusive agreement, I can talk to them about their next agreement, but I can't really advise them. It says I shouldn't advise them on how to break their existing agreement, how to, how to get out of it. Um, no. And of course, the answer of get, getting out of it, by the way, if your agent really isn't performing um, and, and they care about their online reviews, uh, they're very unlikely to fight you too hard, especially if it's not working, right? They've invested. Look, there's a sunk cost. The, the videography, the photography, the pricing, all the showings that they've attended, all the work that you've done to this point is a sunk cost. And... What they really should be doing is thinking about now and the future and the impact of forcing someone to work with you, yeah. right? And that's the conversation that they should be having. And it's a conversation that that agent should be having with their employing broker. And it's happened to me where my agents come to me and said, Osman, this person wants to fire me after three months. I've done so much work for them. And now they're very unhappy and they just want to go work with somebody else. Should I, I, I can't believe it. I'm so insulted. They don't value me. And my answer is usually, look, if you can't, you got one shot at fixing this, you should sit down with them and listen to what their concerns are and what their needs are. You should look at yourself in the mirror and ask, are you the right person to serve these needs? But if the relationship is irretrievably broken, you should let them go and you should wish them well. And odds are they weren't a good fit for you either. Maybe their expectations are really out of line with the market. Maybe they're disrespectful. Maybe, maybe they'll never be happy and you'll never actually be able to be successful with these people. Do you really want to risk all these bad reviews to have this agent relationship? But I can't tell a buyer or seller that's under an exclusive agreement what I just no. said, right? 
I can't say, hey, you should threaten them with a bad review. That's a really bad thing to say, <laughs> okay? And then the Real Estate Commission probably would say, not only is it bad, but we're going to fine you for saying that to somebody who called you by yeah. whatever number they're going to fine me. Because they are very clear, you should not be giving advice to somebody who's in an exclusive buyer agency agreement or a listing agreement. They're both technically listing agreements with, a, with their agent. <laughs> That's not your business to advise them. That is an attorney's business to advise them. So you can say you might want to talk to an attorney. Um, but that's about all you can say because you, you're not supposed to be interfering with another agent's relationship. Now, a lot of agents are going to ignore this, okay, because there's a lot of people that are unethical and don't play by the rules. But I have to play by the rules and I, just how I'm wired. So if these clients are listening to this podcast, that's what I wish I could have told you when you called. And if you're not, well... You know, best of luck. And even so, I don't think, uh, and that's what happened this week. There is somebody who called me and wanted to get out of an exclusive agreement and very unhappy with their agent and they regret not hiring us. And I had to tell them, you need to consult with an attorney. And oh, by the way, I don't think this agent's ever going to let you out because that's <laughs> how the agent not rolls. in her nature. Yeah. yeah, that's not how she rolls. Um, her, her ego fills a room and I don't think that she's going to look at her investment in the past as a sunk cost which is what she should do, but I don't think she will. So I think you're probably stuck with this relationship until the listing agreement that you signed expires and the holdover period is also over. So this, is, this also brings up the importance of having this conversation with your agent, buy or sell side, about what they're actually gonna be doing for you. Mm -hmm. Like why are you signing up for a year long agreement with somebody that you don't have a trusted relationship with? You're not sure if they're actually the right fit for you. You're not sure what services they provide. I mean, we do so much on both the buy and sell side, Hamish, that I can just rattle it off and tell you how we're different and how we're doing things that other people aren't doing. It's like you get a bill, including you want it itemized, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, you're going to get it, with us. You're going to get it itemized. But a lot of agents, especially on the buy side, have no idea how to communicate what they actually mm -hmm. do. And they get very, and a lot of buy, and a lot of consumers have an idea of what agents do. So they're like, well, agents just show houses. So why am I going to pay this person 2.8%, 3.2%, whatever the number, just to, walk to unlock house. doors yeah. for me? <laughs> I've already done all the work. I found the house. What are you doing? Right? And, and they're right to ask those questions. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. And we can answer that question in so much detail because I've spent 20 years building our portfolio of services for what we actually do. <laughs> And I know how it's better than anybody else. And when you're explaining it, you run out of breath the same way you just did. Too. Yeah. Even, even uh, the, the clients that just closed in Louisville just shared that with me. They're like, you, like we, we're thinking about hiring an agent in our hometown, but you're so much better than any agent we've ever talked to that we're really like frustrated with our local market and what options we have. Can you help us find an agent? And I explained to them, all right, we can do that. They'll pay us a referral fee and we'll interview them, but I can't promise you that yeah. they're going to perform. Because there's a lot, there's a lot of sucky agents out there, and it's hard to even for us, it's hard to find a good one. But we're gonna, we're in a better position to, our our bullshit detector is better than yours because we know what agents bullshit about. All right, that's two censorships at the you, one. <laughs> I don't think I don't think you have to beep it out. Hamish. Oh, if you're cool, I think with we're it, an adult podcast. It, yeah. I, it's not any. I think you can leave the BS. We don't use that much profanity. No, we're good. We're not, we're not on the radio. The FCC does not regulate our podcast. Just leave it in. I mean. This is the real us anyway. Yeah. And occasionally you might get some... Pro I'm from New York. <laughs> You're going to get some profanity. But I'm from upstate New York. So we're going to deliver it. We're going to deliver it nicely. Yeah. <laughs> With a smile. <laughs> yeah, well, we're, we're, we're still direct, but we're, profanity is less common no, it's, in upstate New York. It's tough. Um, I just read through the listing agreement at the start of when, when you introduced this topic to see if I could identify anything crazy. And honestly, I'm not going to really go past this uh because you really should consult legal legal advice um if you're in a contract that you'd like to get out of start with finding somebody for that um yeah sticky situation i tell people and they ask me how can i get out of this agreement with you i'm going to say if we're not performing i will let you out of this agreement these are the things here, here are the standard duties that's given here are the additional things we're going to do and if and basically the way I think about this agreement is this is a marriage and in a marriage, you don't just start dating other people. Mm -hmm. you, you actually talk about 
I mean, uh, the whole polycule topic aside, in theory, in your committed relationship with somebody, you talk about your needs, you talk about what's not working, and you try to solve those before you put up, you know, before you start calling other people for dates. Like, that's, that's not cool. And that's what this agreement is, is that forces us to have a conversation about what's not working. And you have my commitment that if we actually aren't meeting your needs, we've had a heart to heart, we've sat down. Um, and, and let's say you say to me, oh, Compass has got this private client network and I hear my cousin bought a house that way. It's such a good deal. I want to be part of that. I'm going to pull down the last 300 sales that Compass has done and show you how the vast majority of them are not private client yeah. network. It's nonsense. Yeah. It's BS. It's marketing. Okay. And then if you still believe it, you can't, you know, and you're absolutely miserable working with me, I'm going to let you out because I don't want to work with somebody who doesn't believe in me. No. That's okay. I just did this. That's a silver lining right? for just, a no fanfare closing. If you have a client that hates your guts, then, then it works. Right, but right. Yeah. Right. So, you know, we choose to work with the people that choose us. And if I if we have not done a good job with that, look, not everyone's a good fit for, for what we do. And some people come to the table with preconceived notions that you cannot convince them of anything different. Mm. And so if that's the case, you should you should end the relationship and choose somebody else. That does value what you do. And that isn't just real estate advice. That's life advice. Preach. All right. I'm done. <laughs> Deal pressure. Let's talk about the second thing. And then we're going to wrap up this podcast. Oh, yeah. So what if the other offer? Okay. Let's, let's back up. Here's the scenario. You're a buyer. You've spent some time looking at homes. And now you've targeted a home that appears to have been on the market a while. So you submit your offer and you submit a low offer. What are the odds somebody else is interested in the house and you get this phone call from your agent and says, great, your offer is okay, but there's somebody else that's thinking about offering. You're going to have to improve your offer if you want this house. The surprise bidding war. What are the odds of that happening? And here's reality. It happens more often than you would expect. And I don't know exactly why this occurs I think it might have something to do with extremely limited supply and groups of buyers that have entered the market at roughly the same time period, looking for roughly the same type of property and the right price range and going through the seasoning at roughly the same time and suddenly realizing that, you know, we're running out of options and I got to buy a house because I need to stay married and my kids need to be in school in the fall. So what are our options? Let's look back at that house we ignored two weeks mm -hmm. ago. It's happening at the same time. There's somebody else doing the same process as you. As rare as it might and seem. And more often than... Uh, unlikely. So the question is always, is this offer fake? Is the competitive offer you're hearing about through your agent that hopefully you trust, is that fake? <coughs> Ooh. Let me take a sip. And the answer is, it might be. But the antidote to worrying whether this a competitive offer is fake or not is market knowledge. So with these clients that we just went under contract with today, we looked at all the home sales that occurred last summer that would have fit their criteria. There's nothing else on the market currently, but that doesn't answer the question of what else could pop up on the market in the next two months, because that would still work mm -hmm. for them. And we looked at it. It turned out there were six other houses like this. And of those six, there were two that were really sexy and really nice. And both of those sold for well over list with bidding wars that were cash deals. Dang. And then there were a bunch of homes that were mediocre, more mediocre than this one and not interesting. And those homes did not get crazy bidding wars. So of those four, what, have, what replacement options would have shown up? Maybe one of those four would have been worth buying other than the home that we decided to go after. So it's sort of a practical approach yeah. to dealing with <coughs> oh, more water. <laughs> No, it helps you um, oh my. rationalize, right? Because it, there's um, almost this, like, I got to have it feeling when you're going to put in an offer. But it's, it's like, okay, how bad do I really want this house? And if I know that the same property is super common, right? Like if there were, say, 100 of these houses that have sold in the last year, then you'd be like, you know what? I, I have a pretty high confidence that another one will show up, right? Oh, I tried to fill it so you wouldn't have to cough again. But <laughs> I, I hit the mute yeah, button. You got it. <clears throat> well, look, this is where it's 
important to have discipline in your offer writing process or in your acceptance of an offer. Mm -hmm. if, if you, yeah, there's two things. One is discipline and the other is market knowledge. And your agent should be providing you with detailed market knowledge so you feel confident about the value of what you're about to go under contract for. And for buyers and for sellers, that means seeing the competition. <clears throat> you should have a good sense of the competition before you price a home and before you accept an offer or before you write an offer and before you accept the counter proposal. You really should know before you get it. And you should have had that conversation with other key decision makers about what the boundaries are. Because what you don't want to have happen is you're suddenly in an auction scenario. And you're swept and you've up. And not it. discussed yeah. you've not discussed yeah. your walkaway number. And I'll never forget. So this is a story you haven't heard, oh. Hamish. So you know I have a camping mm -hmm. van. And it took a long time to find that van and build it. So it started as a cargo van. And there's only a narrow range of years that I was looking at. And I was looking at auctions. And I was very excited to bid on this auction. It was somewhere in the southeast. <clears throat> and Leah comes over. My wife, Leah, comes over. And she's watching what I'm doing. And she's seeing me engage in this <laughs> bidding. And these are very these are low numbers, yeah. right? Like, and so I think it was something like the auction was going up. And the price had reached like $6,000. And Leah looks at me and goes, what's your walkaway oh. number? <laughs> And I'm like, I don't know, maybe seven. And I'm like watching, I'm watching the minutes tick, right? I'm getting excited. And, the, and my bid gets outbid and suddenly it's at seven, two. And I'm about to put seven, five. She's over your she shoulder. Yeah. Remember, <laughs> she's over my shoulder. And remember, this, this, this particular auction has a clock that's literally ticking away and I'm seeing it. And I'm about to put 7,500. She's like, wait, I thought your number was 7,000. Yeah, when it was six. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> But, you know, whatever, it, you know, it's like an extra 500 bucks. And she just looks at me and she goes, what does that mean about you? That someone oh, no. doesn't, uh, doesn't live up to what they committed to. What does that say about you? And I'm just, she's just great for you, look man. At her and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> like, all she had to do was press a little bit on the integrity. Yeah. And I'm like, oh. And so I watched the clock tick out and somebody bought it for like 7,500. It was so close. I'm, everything worked out. I'm happy with what yeah. I got. But it's, it was you very interesting. You got swept up in it, watch. right? <clears throat> but she, you know, she's right. You should have discipline. You should set your bounds before you get in. Um, and and you, should, you, you don't have to share that with me as your agent. You should just know. And you should ask for data and information to help you reach that decision process. And sometimes it's worth overpaying. To get the right house is, frankly, always worth overpaying. To get a great deal on the wrong house is never mm -hmm. worth it. And so that's something you have to, I personally feel very strongly about. But the question is, how much should you overpay? Because just because some moron is spending 200000 over list for a home that is not worth 200000 over list doesn't mean you should spend two fifty, even if you have the capability. And we've seen that story play out. And some of those sellers are now painfully upside down from two years ago uh, because their agent didn't encourage them to be more disciplined. That's right. So they have it's it. easy to or get swept up too, data. you know, and this is real estate. And at least the way Colorado contracts are, you know, we have a time of day deadline, but there's no, it's, it's not a car auction. There's not a timer counting down, <laughs> but you can still get swept away. You know, if you hear about this other offer and they've got an acceptance deadline of X, then suddenly that's in your head and it, you can get lost in it. And, uh, coming back, coming back to zero, coming back to well, center. Right. Let me add one last mm. thought, and, and this is something that most people don't know, and that is as the listing agent, your job is to maintain the Asian. energy, oh. maintain the environment of scarcity to reinforce to the buy side of what a good deal they're getting all the way to closing. And I had a deal a few years ago where there were three competing offers right in the beginning, and the winner went like 20 grand over all the others, and the others ran away. They rescinded. They were like, we're yeah. out. We're going to look at something else. And I had to maintain the bidding war illusion all the way to closing for like 40 days. <laughs> I remember this deal. Yeah. I had a. So and in any event, that was my job when I'm on the listing side is to help that deal get closed, you know, ethically. Um, but you've got to be salesy at that moment, right? Your job is to represent the seller in their best interest. And, um, and sometimes you have, to, you have to fudge a little bit to keep the energy. Yeah. I would not say that's anything deceptive, but if the moment they hear, like if I told them, just imagine the opposite scenario. You're 20,000 over the next best offer. 
You don't know that. So I've told you, you just got it. Just I can't give you the other numbers. Can't show you the other offers, but you barely got it. And the seller just likes you a little more, but you're getting an amazing house. Those other buyers are really regretful. Like that makes you want mm-hmm. it more. And, and if feel I say, like you, you know, you're 20 grand over cool. the next best yeah. offer. And those other buyers just ran away. <laughs> like Everybody <now> left. <laughs> Everyone left and you're 20 grand over list or 200 grand over list. What are you going to do? You're going to look for every yeah, exit in that like, contract to get out of yeah. the deal. So you never would disclose that the other buyers ran away. You would never disclose that there was a giant air ball between the top bid and the next best bid. You never would tell people that because it would damage the deal. As the listing agent, your job is very mm-hmm. different than on the buy side. All right. We have gone long despite my scratchy throat, Hamish. I think uh, it's time for it. you to give us our wrap-up. Oh, it's think? mine. Okay. Um, well, I've, I've listened to a few podcasts. And one of the podcasts that I've listened to, they have an outro um, that asks for a review. Now, everywhere that I listen to podcasts, I've never seen a review form for it. But if you are listening to it on a platform that asks for a review, please give us a review. Um, we like five stars, and uh, we hope to have earned those five stars. However, also leave us yeah. a comment. The comments, we, we answer questions, we answer comments. Um, you can email us, and we will respond. Uh, and we're really thankful for the interaction. It's nice to know that you're out there, and, uh, and, and your feedback is very valuable. So thank yeah, you for that. That's right. And um, so you made it this far, and you're remiss that we're wrapping up the podcast what more content do we have well you should check out our youtube channel we've got neighborhood tours um some of our listings that we've discussed are over there we also have our own instagrams there's a house einstein instagram which will keep you up to date on not just osmond but the other agents in the team and some market stats and um the newsletter we talked about that at the start we're going to talk about it now it's on our website there's a tab up the top it's where we'll be able to give you the skinny on the fresh listings, a little deeper dive into the market conditions, and just some more color overall. So thank you so much for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Thank you again. We appreciate you.